Chapman Studios, the program's viewpoint, and we have an interesting guest this morning. We're talking about donation of organs. Uh, boy, I can't think of a more altruistic thing to do uh, as you step out of this life into the next one. Uh, 648-5510. Somebody may have some questions or some comments about the donation of organ. Uh, go ahead, Judith Kay. Uh, I was wanting to talk a little bit, Marina, about ages. Mm -hmm. Not only the age of donors and what that matters, but also the age of recipients. I'm thinking about your baby mm -hmm. at the age of one. Um, I would I would hope that in a perfect world, if she and I were both in line for being recipients, that uh, she would certainly be looked at first. It's a very complicated algorithm how organs are allocated and it varies from organ to organ. So I can speak um, pretty well on livers because I had researched that, of course. Um, the, the way that they allocate organs is according to how sick you are is really the, the number one factor. <laughs> But there is, so if you have two, if it were you and my daughter, and you guys, you two both had exactly the same terrible lab values that said, gosh, this is a, a person who is really sick, um, then if yours were slightly worse, you would be ahead of her in line, it, with one exception, and that's if there's a pediatric donor. So if somebody, if, if a child dies, then they do give preference to children who are waiting. So that's the one area where she would just uh, move ahead of you even if her labs were slightly better than your labs. And then it also matters how close you are to the donor. Um, so, yeah, well, and of course blood type has to match, you know, all of the factors being equal. Right, but all things being equal, mm -hmm. could I say, oh gee whiz, don't, that'd be absolutely folly to take me ahead of this infant. You know, it's, it's tricky because they do try to make sure that the allocation of organs is as fair and as non-biased as possible. So they do give pediatric recipients an advantage in when there's a pediatric donor. But it's, it's tough. It's really tough. I mean, they, there's a whole medical ethics board that's set up to determine how that waiting list is going to be ordered. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, could, it could happen if you were just slightly sicker um, and it was an, an adult donor. Marina, is there an organ bank like we have a blood bank? No. No, no because I, organs I don't survive that, that long. So there's an eye bank. There are mm -hmm. eye banks to store corneas, and that's why if you um, say you're swimming in contacts and you contract an infection mm -hmm. in your eye that attacks your cornea mm -hmm. um, or you get you're out mowing without sunglasses and you get hit in the eye and it you know again ruins your cornea and you end up needing a corneal transplant there's no waiting list because there's an eye bank that can store corneas but organs don't last that long outside mm -hmm. of the body so there's no bank mm -hmm. for them. That's what's what the what's the balance between uh, need and availability <coughs> uh, it's one-sided it's very one-sided. It's yes. very one-sided. There's a much longer list than there are organs available. 40% um, of the waiting list is made up of people waiting for kidneys. So kidneys is the, are the most needed organ. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And one donor can, can save two kidney recipients because you only need one kidney. So if you, can, you can donate both your kidneys and save two people that way. Mm -hmm. But still, the, the list is long. There are so many diseases that now attack kidneys that the, the list has gotten very long. Well. This um, this matter of, of transplanting organs has become just, I guess, so such a non-rarity today. It's just, uh, it's a very very regular thing. To, mm -hmm. uh, I presume that there are certain hospitals that that specialize in one type of, uh, or another type of. Tra Am I correct in that? Well, yeah. I mean, the the larger hospitals probably do transplants of of all mm -hmm. sorts. But but yeah, it's not it's not something that a lot of smaller hospitals are are doing because that's a pretty um, that's a pretty intensive procedure plus all the follow up that goes up with the the patients to make sure that their organs survive and this gift that's been given to them um, is is able to last for mm -hmm. a very long time. So theoretically, my daughter could live with this liver for the rest of her life. Is there in a perfect a, world. In a perfect world, yes. I love perfect worlds, mm -hmm. though. Uh, what about tissue donation? Mm -hmm. is, is that a newer technology than 
than other organ donations? No, I think I I think that's been around longer. I was surprised. I'm not a real expert on tissue or. Um, cornea transplants, but I was surprised to learn how long tissue and cornea transplants have been being performed. A lot longer mm -hmm. than I had thought that they had been. Organ, organ organ transplants um, in, is, is relatively new. Are tissue uh, transplant donators hard to come by? You don't hit it. I don't know, maybe it's less dramatic or something. Mm -hmm. You don't hear as much about tissue donation as you, you do about well, kidneys, like you said. Right, right, because the stories are sometimes a little less dramatic. So we do run into that sometimes um, I, when I work with um, MTF tissue and the eye bank. So it's important for them to also be included in these stories because people tend to think of, of only donating organs, and that's not all that you can donate. In fact, a lot of the tissue that's being donated right now I have been told, has been going overseas um, for um, the military hospitals. Sure. Mm. Right. So mm. um, it's used on burn victims. Of course, that's the most obvious use of it, but it can also be used mm. um, sometimes when you have a surgery, it's not, you're not completely able to close it up immediately afterwards. And so sometimes donated tissue is used to prevent infection until um, the, the wound is able to heal. So there's lots of uses that people don't even think about. Um, well, and it's important know. to know that when you donate tissue too, you're not like being skinned down to your muscle. People tend to think of that. But the, the skin is removed just from your back, so you can still have an open casket funeral. And the, the layers of skin that are removed are sort of like a sunburn, if you've ever peeled after a sunburn. So they'll take several layers of skin off, um, and it'll be only on your, it'll be in, in places that are non-visible. So if you want to have an open casket funeral, you still can. Sometimes people, I think, are okay with the idea of their organs being taken out, but get a little um, uncomfortable with the notion of removing tissue and it's not I think it is not as as uh, grisly as people tend to think that it's going to be well you you think about flaying you know in right. the days of not. the Romans or right. something no and it's not and you know and then occasionally you'll have these movies where people will have complete eyes transplanted into somebody else's head and that's not the way that it goes either the cornea is just that very thin lens on the very top of yeah. your eye sort of like the thickness of a contact lens is how it's been described to me um, so it's not as if you know, you'll be, somebody else's eyes uh, will be, we'll be walking down the street and you'll see your sister's eyes in somebody else's head and have a moment of terror. No, that's not the way that that Deja goes either. Yes, something. yes. Boy, if they got my tissue, it'd be only good for a saddle somewhere. <laughs> 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 oh, dear. <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty weathery by now. <laughs> Bill. <laughs> uh, uh, seriously. <laughs> uh, um, you better break out the moisturizer. With, <laughs> with respect to, to transplants, um, is there one, is there one, settle down now, <laughs> is there one type of organ that is used more prevalently insofar as your knowledge is concerned? Well, do you mean that is most successfully taken out of donors that survives? I think it would be kidneys, but I'm, don't quote me on that one. Um, so all, all of the organs are needed. The list is long for all of the organs. Um, there are, kidneys is the one, are, are the organ that is most needed, though. That's the one that most people are waiting for. The one that I've heard of very rarely and think is absolutely beyond a miracle mm -hmm. is heart and lung. Right, right. I can't, mm. I mean, this is beyond my kin, let me tell you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the, you know, one of the problems with transplanting those organs are that they are some of the ones that last least longest outside of the body. So sometimes someone will donate and by the time it gets to the recipient, mm -hmm. the, the organ has been damaged. Yeah. So they have been, I have just heard on the news that they have just mm -hmm. developed a technique that allows the, org, the, the lungs to actually keep breathing, keep pumping blood while they're being transported. I and saw that's that. that's going to be so fantastic because it's, you know, how sad to, to donate them and then uh, have them arrive and then it doesn't work. And as a recipient, the, the hope that you feel, having been called in to say, we've got an organ for you, and you drive in, and then you get all ready for surgery, and then they arrive, and then, oh, it's not good. So yeah. I'm so happy that they have developed this new technique. It's going to increase increase the, it reduce the waiting list because more donated organs are going to be able to go right. to people. 
Norway. Do you think that uh, that the idea of keeping all the organs alive will come to pass? Um, sure. Uh, for I instance, uh, that that the kidney still is functioning while it's being transported or the liver is functioning while mm -hmm. it's being transported, is that on the horizon? I think so. I think so, yeah. Amazing. I'm intrigued by how you came by your particular profession, Marina. Uh, it's kind of an esoteric uh, thing as opposed to uh, jobs at this office mm -hmm. or that office. So uh, there's so many different facets of health care. Mm -hmm. How did you find this particular uh, calling? Well, I had volunteered, um, needless to say, after I brought home a child who yeah. uh, could have been gone by the age of one, and now I've got an almost 13-year-old. I began volunteering for Gift of Hope and also for the Secretary of State's office. Mm -hmm. um, so when they would run registry tables, I would volunteer um, to go and work at those tables. And so I got to know many of the people who worked in the organ tissue donor program. And so when this position opened up, they contacted me and asked me if I would be willing to, to take the position. And of course I was. So, so you started by essentially giving back in, in, yes. in gratitude for it what really, had been done for you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Decide to put something in the bar beside your elbow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. How many children do you have? I have two. And is is the other he or she? <laughs> she. Frankie, though. So Her people girls. Get, uh -huh, two girls. Yeah, I, that's what I did, too. I had girls. I like girls. I like girls, too. <laughs> Now, boys eat a lot. <laughs> Pardon? Well, boys eat a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, they have a hollow leg. That's part of their problem. Um, did, 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 were you afraid when the other child was being born that, oh, dear, I hope everything's... Uh, that's your first mm -hmm. thought normally <clears throat> as you're having a child anyway is, please, that mm -hmm. she's okay. Yes. No, I mean, I was worried that something something else would go wrong having had sort of a, an unusual thing go wrong with our first child mm -hmm. but we knew for sure that biliary atresia her disease is is absolutely not genetic so um we were so someday she'll be able to be a mother and she'll not have to be concerned about this oh annika my daughter who's had the transplant yes 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 she should be able to um it's <laughs> You know, pediatric liver transplants are still <laughs> relatively new. So I, I know um, a woman in Minnesota who has had her transplant. She was transplanted as a child, and she's had her transplant for some 25 years now, um, although she has not had children yet. So there's some, I, you know, I don't know exactly how, how that works. I'm not sure if they all know exactly how it works, um, if, because she's on medicines for the rest of her life. So yes. I'm not sure how those medicines agree with pregnancy, although I do know a liver transplant recipient who did successfully have a baby after her transplant. So theoretically possible, but it's still sort of an up-in-the-air question. There's a plethora of medicine to be taken the rest mm -hmm. of your life if you're yes. a transplant recipient. Yes. They are pioneering studies as well, though, so that recipients no longer have to take those immunosuppressive medicines. So some kids at Children's, well, Lurie, now Lurie Children's in Chicago, mm -hmm. have been part of a pilot study that has been reducing their immunosuppression to see how low they can take it without causing rejection. And some kids actually turn out, can completely go off of those meds. But it depends upon how your body um, is reacting to the liver and what sort of state your immune system is in, whether your immune system is sort of hyperactive and will tend to go after that new liver or whether it's a laid-back immune system. <laughs> Would the being without the medicine be more apt to happen to someone who's younger as opposed to older? That I don't know. I th you would think that that would be right. That sort of makes sense from a practice, but that's a medical question that I really wouldn't know the answer to. Does your daughter still have to take medication? Absolutely. And will she continually through her life as a result of mm -hmm. this? Yes, uh -huh. yes. You know, and she is not allowed to do these studies because she's had three liver transplants. So they're not, they're not taking any chances with this yeah, liver absolutely. at all yeah. because they do not want her to have to be transplanted mm -hmm. again because three transplants is a lot, especially when you know that you've got a waiting list of people waiting. So mm -hmm. she's been transplanted three times. They, they now, keep her on a pretty steady medication. Frequently? Or regularly for uh, for exams? She's gone down now just to annual exams, which uh -huh. is wonderful. Like the rest of the world. That's right. Uh -huh. yeah. She does labs much more frequently than that. So they monitor her and make sure her liver is happy. But as long as her liver is happy according to the lab values, they just see her once a year. 
But other than not playing professional football, yes, and mm -hmm. taking which was a blow. Musician out of her. Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. or take and mm -hmm. and taking her medicines all the time. Mm -hmm. Really, there's no difference between her and anybody else who's in the sixth or seventh grade. There is not. There is not. And you know, you tend to think of of them being very delicate and fragile. And I know I thought of her that way when I first brought her back home. Oh, but I was man. shocked with this last uh, tummy bug season. That we won't uh -huh. go into any details there. But I will tell you that mine lasted three times as long as hers did. So evidently, her immune system is perfectly capable of fighting things off better than my old 42-year-old system is. <laughs> in your experience in this profession, uh, have there any, are there any unusual incidents that, that you can recount right now that uh, might be of, of interest to anybody? Unusual incidents in... I'm just wondering if there are any particular cases that would come to mind real quickly that were unusual. That Miracles. Turned, mm, yeah. <laughs> for Miracles. something you better say yeah i know well you know almost every single story that you hear of involving kids and transplants there is that air of miracle about it because you are sitting there thinking you know how has this happened and how will i ever get through and, and you cannot help but imagine what your life is going to be like as a parent who's lost a child and i in waiting in the hospital met several parents whose children did not make it and so you have almost this you you can feel it you can see it you you almost are are living it in your head before it happens so when your child does somehow make it through you get that call somebody has donated um, an organ that's going to save your child's life you are just flat on the floor feeling that weight that you've been carrying around just lifting off of you and that's the same experience I've heard from every single parent who has been waiting um, for their child to be saved by an organ donor so almost every single story has that air of wow I, I can't believe that happened I can't believe this child is here running around in front of me it would be I would think a religious experience it is it most is. certainly it is. You know, you had an infant that received an organ going to the other end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Is there a cutoff point in our life when you, science can say, oh, I don't think we ought to give them or he or she. Uh, is, there, is there a limit? I don't know that there's an, an absolute limit that's set across the board. I know every single hospital has to evaluate a patient who's going to be put onto the waiting list mm -hmm. to make sure that they are in good enough health that if an organ is donated to them that they would be able to accept that organ and use it. And I don't know that there's some sort of cutoff that says, okay, now at, at this point, I think it's up to the hospital on a case-by-case well, basis. It seems there's like no if we rules. were able to reason, if we were able to reason, most of us in the geriatric category would say, well, what's got that? What's, what's, what's got a younger person have, have that? Mm -hmm. As opposed to, it seems, it just seems it might be a little selfish to take mm -hmm. a, a good organ when somebody down the road, uh, younger, much younger, could use it. Mm -hmm. Right. My neighbor, that when I moved into my new house, her brother received a, a liver transplant when he was either late 50s, early 60s. And well, that's a kid. And yeah, but yeah, you know, it depends so on which end you're looking at it from. <laughs> yeah, and, but he did. He he kept that liver for some twenty sure. years, and that's a long time. That twenty years is nothing to sneeze at. True. So yeah. Before the old clock on the wall throws us out of here yet did. again, mm -hmm. well, it's it's going to have to be a little patient, Jim, sweetie, sweetie. <laughs> um, let's let's say if if you feel that for you in your life it would be important to consider donation how does one go about it other than with can you do you have to wait till you have to renew your driver's license you don't you can do it in about 15 seconds online so if you go to lifegoeson.com www.lifegoeson.com that's the secretary of state's organ and tissue donation page and there's a link to his registry if you do need your driver's license or your state id because it is linked to that and you just input your information hit submit and then you'll get a letter from the secretary of state thanking you for joining the registry about three weeks later you can also though go into any driver's facility 
or you can also just call the, the program itself. So, but online is so easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, Judith made a good point. The uh, website then, lifegoeson.com. Lifegoeson.com. It's very simple to remember. Uh, Marina Tedu, we think, have I got that correction? No. Mm -hmm, uh, you have. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, thank you very much for being with us and Thanks spending so your much. time this morning driving down from normal. Uh, beautiful ride in the country. Not so this morning. Mm -hmm. We're great. Mm -hmm. We appreciate your presence. Uh, it's a very, very important subject and something that we don't normally think about. In the matters of health, I came across this saying, be careful of reading health books. You could die of a misprint. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marina, for being with us this morning.